Okay, good morning. Uh, let's get started. Any questions? Questions? Okay, uh, so uh, if uh, you like basketball, uh, this may remind you of the NBA trophy, the Larry O'Brien. If you like soccer, maybe the uh, Champions League trophy. But we are in an electrostatics class, so it's actually the Van der Graaff uh, generator. So that's what it is. And uh, uh, this uh, mechanism charges uh, the sphere, and in fact, charges the sphere strong enough uh, so that uh, it can break down the surrounding air. So it generates a field that exceeds uh, 3 uh, kilovolts per millimeter or 3 megavolts uh, per meter. So that if I'm holding here a neon lamp, it will actually turn it on eventually, even without um, you know, touching the conductor. Touching the conductor. So I'm starting now the, uh, the generator. So eventually that will be uh, charging the, yeah. takes uh, some time. I'm not, can increase a little bit the speed. And you can see the neon um, bulb. I don't turn off the lights. Uh, I think the spark is strong enough so that you can see it. OK? So this is a dielectric breakdown. The surrounding air is a dielectric. But now the strong uh, field actually strong enough so that uh, there is current basically flowing through the air and the current that you can see in uh, the neon um, lamp. So that is uh, my little demonstration for today. And uh, eventually it will actually uh, okay. move out also. Okay. All right, so let's discharge it fully so that uh, nobody is in danger, especially myself, I guess. Uh, so any uh, second call for any uh, questions? So then I have a question for you, which is related to this experiment, and it's related to boundary conditions that we saw yesterday. Uh, why the lightning arrester is like this? So you know the CN Tower and not like this. So I will collect the cups and uh, will let you think about this for a moment. So why is the lightning arrester like this and not like that? Any ideas? So you remember from the boundary conditions at a conductor, the electric field is proportional to surface charge density. OK, we uh, saw yesterday this boundary condition at the interface between dielectric and conductor. D1 inside the conductor is zero. There is no field inside the conductor. That means that the electric field perpendicular to the conductor is proportional to surface charge density. Okay. So now when a cloud passes by here, it will attract all, if you wish, it will repel negative charges down the road so that there will be an excess of positive charges at the top of the rod. But now, because the rod is ending at an edge, the surface charge density right there can become very, very strong despite even a small amount of charges. So it takes a small amount of charge at the edge of the rod to make the actual charge density very high because at the edge, the surface area goes to zero. That's what an edge is. So therefore, rho sub s is very high. That means the electric field is very high. 
and hence it quickly breaks down uh, the uh, three kilovolt per millimeter limit that it needs in order to ionize this air so that the uh, surrounding air becomes a conductor and through that um, layer of air the cloud is discharged and the lightning is arrested before it hits the ground. You see this one would not do the same trick that easily because now you have a very high area and then you need a lot of charge in order to uh, form a field that will go above three kilovolts per millimeter and will break uh, the air. So in this case, you are actually running the risk that the ground, the houses down here will actually come first and the cloud will be discharged to the ground instead of uh, to the lightning arrester. So you really need this uh, edge that we see in the lightning arrester. Uh, you see it right here. This is also a small protection from the Van der Graaff generator in case you run it for a long time, uh, that this one is supposed to discharge it down to the ground. So that is a, a little um, application of this uh, boundary condition that we saw uh, yesterday in something that you see uh, almost every day. There is a lot of lightning arresters uh, in the city and around the city. And I'd like to uh, close the chapter of capacitors now with the question, how much energy do they carry? This calculation of how much energy does a capacitor carry is based upon the quantity that uh, I won't prove how it came about. I will just give it to you for granted. And uh, if you have questions of how we arrive in this, uh, uh, in this uh, quantity, please come talk to me. This is the electrostatic energy density, volume density, or electric energy density. So that tells you how much energy per unit volume is carried by an electric field. And that is 1 half dielectric permittivity field magnitude squared. So this is uh, energy density is given in joules per meter cubed, volume density. So how can I use this to calculate the energy stored in a capacitor? Let's see the example of the parallel plate capacitor again. Parallel plate capacitor. Uh, so. I'm taking the usual uh, configuration where we have uh, the upper plate, the lower plate, H, an area of plates equal to A. Voltage V0 between the two plates. You remember that the electric field in this case is uniform, or we can approximate it as uniform. So it is equal to minus z hat v naught over h. That means that the electric energy density per unit volume is constant throughout the capacitor, because the electric field magnitude is constant, doesn't vary. And that is equal to 1 half epsilon uh, E squared, V naught squared over H squared. So then the total energy that is stored in the capacitor can be found by integrating this over the entire volume. So now the capital W sub E can be found by integrating this 1 half epsilon V naught squared H squared over the entire volume of the capacitor. Here it so happens that the energy density is constant. Therefore, there is nothing to integrate, really. You multiply that constant with the total volume of the capacitor. And that will be 
one half epsilon v naught squared over h squared times the total volume of the capacitor, which is the area of the plates A times the height H. That's the total volume of the capacitor. So A times H. And out of this, you uh, end up with a very well-known relation that you have seen in uh, circuits, because you can uh, see this as 1 half epsilon a over h v naught squared. So this is uh, the capacitance. We uh, calculated it yesterday of the capacitor. So basically the energy there is 1 half c v naught squared. A very well known formula. So you see that this calculation that is based now on electric field gives you a consistent answer with what you have seen in circuits. But it is a much more general calculation. We will see uh, several examples um, in, the, in today's lecture and, and uh, subsequent lectures in preparation for your midterm, uh, where you will see how we can actually compute energies stored in general, um, in general capacitors. Any questions up to this point? All right. So uh, before I uh, move on to the, um, or maybe I will just do one example. Uh, and give you the general methodology that, we sh that you will follow or that you can follow in uh, problems with capacitors and capacitance calculations. Please go ahead. Is uh, the midterm coverage up to today's lecture? Yes, the, the midterm covers everything in chapter four except for the method of images, uh, which is image method. It's the last section that we have taken out. However, I will talk about this today for 10, 15 minutes because it is included in your lab. So it's not in the midterm, but it's in the lab. So that's why I will spend 15 minutes today to just go over it. It's a very simple uh, concept anyway. Okay. All right, uh, so uh, cal calculation of capacitance. General methodology, that is. And uh, I really emphasize um, multi-step methods that uh, you can use in the homework problems and uh, can get you started. So at least uh, you know how to start uh, when you have problems that ask, take this and find how much is the capacitance there or how much is the energy stored. Uh, so first of all, let me uh, remind you that a capacitor is generally two conductors, the one charged with plus Q, the other with minus Q. There is a voltage here, V. The field develops from the positive to the negative. Okay, And what we call the capacitance is this ratio of Q over V. And that Q over V is a constant. And that means that when you want to calculate the capacitance, you have two ways to do it, and they will give you the same result. You either set Q, you find the field, and you calculate the voltage, and Q over V is capacitance. Or you set V, you find the potential, typically from Laplace's equation, and then from the potential you find the field, and then from the field uh, you find the charge through boundary conditions. So there are these two alternative ways that I will demonstrate now through a problem. So instead of giving you the steps in theory, I will actually uh, uh, show you the steps of the two approaches for finding the capacitance of two spheres two concentric spheres.
So this is our geometry. We have uh, this x, y, z coordinate system. I have one sphere of radius A. And I'm talking about metallic sphere. So these are perfect conductors. And another sphere outside of radius B. So in between the spheres, there is a dielectric of dielectric permittivity epsilon equal epsilon not epsilon r. So if you want to see the cross section of this, you will have the first sphere radius A, the second sphere of radius B. So it's not a cylinder like the coaxial cable, it is two spheres. And we want to find the capacitance between the two. Okay. So first approach. Set Q, find the field, typically from Gauss's law, then find V. If you have the field, you can find the voltage, and then the capacitance will be Q over V. And be confident setting the Q. Don't worry that you are introducing a new unknown. It may seem counterintuitive that I'm trying to solve a problem, and instead of getting to the unknown that is asked for, I'm introducing a new unknown. That's not a problem. Q over V is a constant. So Q will actually cancel out at the end. So there is no problem. So I'm saying let there be charge Q in the inner sphere. And this is the outer sphere. How can I find the electric field that is surrounding that sphere? I can apply Gauss's law. I can apply Gauss's law because uh, this is a structure. So the first step here is set Q. On the inner sphere plus Q. So this is a sphere R equals A. Second, now that I have Q, find the field. This is a, a structure with spherical symmetry. And therefore, I can apply Gauss's law on a sphere. So since I have, uh, remember, Gauss's law is universally true, however, useful only when you have either rectangular cylindrical or spherical symmetry. And when you do have spherical symmetry, the electric field you know has only a radial component and points in the radial direction. And in that case, Gauss's law can be effective, can give you the unknown field if applied on a, on a sphere. So this is uh, then the situation. I have the inner conductor with this plus Q. And I apply Gauss's law in a sphere, on a sphere, of radius R. So the outer conductor is outside at radius uh, B. So B, A, R is in between. I will uh, use the latest form we've seen for Gauss's law with the electric flux density. So that says that uh, D dot DS will be Q enclosed. But Q enclosed is the charge that I set. That's the Q enclosed. Q encloses the charge that I set myself. So then we have 
you see the form of D follows the form of E because those two are proportional. And therefore, I have here a D vector that has only a radial component, depends on R, is in the R direction. So when you pick DS, you go to your H sheet and you find the differential surface element that points in the radial direction. That's the one that you need to choose here on the sphere. And that differential surface element is uh, R hat R squared sine theta d theta d phi. So this will be equal to Q. R dot R is equal to 1. DR is a constant and R squared is a constant. They are not integrated on the sphere, they are constant. And then we have an integral with respect to theta that goes from 0 to pi and with respect to phi, which goes from 0 to pi, this is 4 pi r squared. And really, the, the result that I'm about to derive, you could have derived it by inspection. The electric field will be the same as if you had this charge Q, not distributed on the sphere, but right at the center as a point charge. It will be Q by 4 pi r squared. So you see it from here. If this is equal to Q, dr is Q by 4 pi r squared. And that means that the electric field is Q by 4 pi epsilon r squared. So that is now the electric field. Okay. So that is uh, generally the case. You see that the electric field is the same as if instead of having a sphere like this one, where the uh, charge is distributed on the surface and it's equal to Q, it's the same as if uh, the, uh, the charge was a point charge at the origin. That would have exactly the same field. And that is a consequence of Gauss's law. So I found the electric field. And uh, now I am at step C, which is find the voltage. The voltage from the positive conductor to the negative conductor. So I just need to take the field that I found and integrate it from the positive to the negative conductor. So the field is Q by 4 pi epsilon R squared. It's in the radial direction. And I will also integrate in the radial direction. You remember this integral is path independent. So the field lines point like this. So I will go and integrate along the field line. I'm not. Uh, ignoring the fact that the field points this way and I should go like this. No, I will go along the field line. And the field line is the radial direction, which means DL will be R dr. And you see R dot R here is equal to 1. I'm integrating with respect to dr, and that means that I go from A to B. And that is uh, Q by 4 pi epsilon. The integral uh, here of uh, dr over r squared is minus 1 over r. From a to b. And that means that the potential is q by 4 pi epsilon 1 over a minus 1 over b. And now you see that uh, I am at the very last step, step D. I have the charge, I set the charge, and I have found the potential. And I do Q over V to find the capacitance. And uh, that pops out right away. So it's 4 pi epsilon by 1 over A minus 1 over B. So that is the capacitance. So any questions up to this point? This is the first method. I'm leveraging the fact that Q over V is a constant. And therefore, I can set Q myself, and then I find V. And I do Q over V. So you see that 
I introduced this unknown myself, but at the end, it canceled out. So there is nothing to worry about. If the calculation is correct, this unknown that you inject will at the end cancel out. And Q over V is supposed to be a constant that depends only on the geometry and the materials as it shows here. You see, if I had put, if I had taken the second conductor to infinity, then this capacitance would be the self-capacitance of a sphere that stands alone, just like this sphere right here, which has a self-capacitance with respect to its environment. And uh, you see, when uh, B goes to infinity, this capacitance is the self-capacitance of, of the sphere, of the inner sphere, with respect to infinity, so it's as if you have a second conductor at infinity. And that will be 4 pi epsilon times A. So our uh, little capacitor there, uh, sorry, sphere, the Van der Graaff generator, has a capacitance with respect to its environment that is 4 pi epsilon alpha. And you may question now, what is, why is this relevant? When uh, we design touchpads like this, touchpads, touchpads are capacitive sensors. So underneath uh, the screen, there, is, there are two arrays of conductors. You don't see those conductors because they are made out of indium tin oxide, among other materials, that are transparent. They are optically transparent. So you don't see them very well. Yeah, you can see them if you look very carefully, but these are two arrays. They are uh, printed on different levels. One array is like this, and uh, it's being driven by sources, and I'm talking about one of the geometries that uh, are used, terminated at uh, some loads. Uh, and uh, then you have another array like this. And that array is also either driven or it can be terminated. But the point is that these conductors have capacitances. And those capacitances can be measured by the circuits that are terminating uh, this array on left and right. And when you come in and you with your finger and you touch here, what you are actually doing is you are perturbing the capacitance. And how much you are perturbing this capacitance is a function, of course, of your finger, your humidity and everything. However, you are bringing your own capacitance, which is what we call the self-capacitance, to the environment. So to calculate this capacitance, you would take the second conductor to infinity, and you would find the, uh, you would put on yourself a charge Q, you would go to a solver, a numerical solver, and you would find the electric field that this charge produces on your body, and then you would find the voltage that you have to a remote point at infinity, at some point that converges. And this is the notion of the self-capacitance. So I say all this to emphasize that capacitance is a very general concept, and it's not really only limited to having two plates. You can consider any body as having a capacitance to other conductors, including the infinity, the environment, the ground, uh, uh, the ceiling, and, and all uh, surrounding uh, objects. And how we uh, optimize and design touchpads is really one uh, example where this concept comes in very, very handy, and it's a very critical uh, one to get the touchpad performance uh, right. So this is the first way to solve this problem. Any, any questions? So second way to solve this problem, uh, on not this particular problem, but any problem that involves capacitances, especially if you don't have symmetry. So then what, what do you do? The second way, so method number two, method number two, is you actually set the voltage uh, 
then find the electric field Typically, this would entail a step where you solve the Laplace equation. And you do E equals minus gradient of V to find the electric field and D equals to epsilon E. And then you find the charge. How do you find the charge from a boundary condition? So then calculate the charge from the boundary condition. So you have a conductor like this. You have found from the previous step the d vector, and then you go and say n that d will be the surface charge density, and then q will be the surface charge density integrated over the entire conductor. Remember, the conductors like this one support only charges on the surface. There is nowhere else any more charge to be found. So therefore, if you want to find the charge that comes into the capacitance at Q over V, all you need to do is find the surface charge density here, and then you find the charge from that. So I can do that as well in this problem, starting So this is the first step. I go to the my two conductors. And I set the voltage. How do I set the voltage? I connect a voltage source. And I set the potential here to V0 and the potential here to 0. Can I do this? Yes, I can do this. Because the conductors are equipotential surfaces. So I can say that the potential here on this inner conductor is constant. Well, let this constant be V0. And the potential here is constant in the outer conductor. Well, let this constant be zero. So effectively, I have set, I have set the potential difference between the two conductors, V0 and zero. Again, uh, I am leveraging here the fact that Q over V will be constant. So I can either set Q and find V or set V and find Q, and those two will give me the same, the same result. Unless, of course, I make a mistake. Okay. If I don't, then they should give me the same result. So now, when you see something like this, immediately you are thinking of the Laplace equation. Immediately, you are thinking of the Laplace equation or the Poisson equation. Here we have a uniform dielectric. Epsilon is constant. Therefore, I can go ahead and uh, say that uh, this, uh, satisfy, this satisfies the Laplace equation. So I am actually in step two, where I want to find E. And uh, the first uh, part will be that I need to solve the Poisson or the Laplace equation. Remember, the Laplace equation is the form of the Poisson when you have no rho sub v and uniform medium. So uniform medium, no rho sub v. Under these two conditions, the uh, Poisson equation reduces to the Laplace equation. These two conditions are met here because we have no uh, volume charge density in between. How do I know that? What's that? In between. In between, I don't have a conductor. Because it's a dielectric. There is no free charge there. All charges are bound. So rho sub v has to be 0. So this is met. And this is met because epsilon is constant. So epsilon is constant meets this. Dielectric means no free charge meets that. And therefore, the potential has to satisfy the Laplace equation. 
And I write here that V depends only on R. I know this from the spherical symmetry. So this is a problem where you have spherical symmetry. You have two spheres. If you are thinking about what kind of symmetry I have, it's like a no-brainer. It's two spheres. It's a spherical symmetry. The potential in the fields can only depend on the radial uh, coordinate of the spherical coordinate system. And therefore, this now, I will solve it in the spherical coordinates. And that is That is this. And uh, this one is outside place, no roll. Um, from the first derivative, I get that r squared dv over dr is equal to some constant, c1. And then that means dv over dr is c1 over r squared. Now I need to integrate this once more. The integral of 1 over r squared is minus 1 over r. So I have v equals to minus c1 over r plus some constant c2. I have two constants out of this integration, but I have also two boundary values that will help me determine those constants. And you see the. I will find C1, C2 from boundary conditions. And uh, the first is minus C1 over A plus C2 equals to V0. That is the condition that at A, this is equal to v naught, And the second condition is that minus c1 over b plus c2 is equal to 0. That is a more convenient one. It's from the fact that I have grounded the outer conductor. Why? Because that's what I chose to do. It's up to me. It's an equipotential surface. I set the voltage to 0. And then the, the potential difference I set to v naught. So then I choose the actual values of the absolute potentials accordingly. So if I uh, subtract uh, the one from the other, if I subtract, uh, let's say, one from two, equal to V naught. So C1 is minus V naught by 1 over a minus 1 over b. So you see this constant that also appeared before. And then uh, that means that c2, which is c1 over b, is equal to minus v0 uh, b over a minus 1. So that gives me the potential uh, throughout the conductor. Um, I, I, I can uh, put it together so you can see it. It's V naught 1 over A minus uh, 1 over B R. I had a minus sign here with another minus sign. Uh, minus V naught B over A minus 1. So you see at r equals uh, b, indeed, it gives you 0. At r equals a, you can uh, test it. It uh, gives you v0. And now I can find the field having the potential the electric field is minus gradient of v. is minus dv over dr. So it is this one 
I'm not going to go and do differentiations right here from scratch. So I'm a little bit more observant than that. And I see my expression for the electric field, and I recognize that I have found it here at an intermediate step. It's uh, C1 over R squared. That is C1. And then the electric field is minus R hat. C1 is minus V naught, 1 over A minus 1 over B, divided by R squared. And I find exactly the same expression, or I actually didn't find that expression before, but I will find it now. So minus and minus is plus V naught, 1 over A minus 1 over B, R squared. At this point, you can already see that I will get the same result as before. Uh, because uh, that tells me that q by 4 pi epsilon is v naught by 1 over a minus 1 over b. So I will get the same result. It's obvious at this point. However, I will solve this example through just for the sake of demonstrating the entire method. So now that I have the electric field, I can find the electric flux density d, which is epsilon times this. And now I have to find q. So the last step is find q. Find Q at the inner conductor. I can find Q at the inner or the outer, con outer, outer, outer conductor. It's not a problem, but it's, uh, I will do it in the inner conductor. It's a little bit more obvious for you to see. So at the uh, surface of the conductor, I have a surface charge density. How do I find this? I find this from boundary conditions. So first, I find rho sub s. First, I find rho sub s. And I will find it from the boundary condition at the conductor. What we called yesterday n hat is actually, in this case, the radial unit vector r hat. Why? Because the inner conductor is a sphere. At a sphere, r is constant. The normal unit vector is the r hat unit vector. So that is the r hat. And the boundary condition reads r dot d at r equals a right outside the conductor minus 0 is equal to rho sub s. So I need to take my field and evaluate it at r equals a. You see, these are boundary conditions. They apply right at the interface, right on the surface of the interface, which is the R equals A surface. And that means that I go here, I put R hat, epsilon V naught, 1 over A minus 1 over B times R squared, which is A squared. So that means that the surface charge density, r dot r is equal to 1, that means that the surface charge density at the inner sphere is epsilon v naught a squared. Let me leave this a squared there. So how much then is the charge? I have to integrate this over the entire sphere. There is nothing to integrate. It's a constant. So I just multiply that constant times the area of the sphere, which is 4 pi a squared. So that gives me that q is equal to 4 pi a squared times epsilon v naught a squared 1 over a minus 1 over b. The a squares cancel out, and then I have Q over V naught, which is my capacitance, again, equal to 4 pi epsilon, 1 over A minus 1 over B. Same result. 
So you see, I did find the same result. Avoid the typos along this way. And the point here to be made is that I could arrive at the same result through those two different paths. And it's up to you, whatever you're more comfortable with, whether there are symmetries in the problem that would allow you to go the first path, because that involves Gauss's law. And therefore, I had to uh, use Gauss's law. That means that I had to uh, have a symmetric problem. Otherwise, uh, this path wouldn't be necessarily feasible. All right, so these are my two methods to solve the same problem. Both of them are based upon the idea that Q over V is constant. So you either set Q and find V, uh, or you set V and find Q. Uh, any questions? All right, uh, so in your lab, you will see the method of images. And uh, I will say a few things today. And please, if you read the, uh, my, the lab handout and you have a problem or a, a question, bring it back to, my, to the Monday lecture or, of course, to my office hours that have been very quiet. They are on Wednesdays uh, after the class. Uh, and uh, I will have additional office hours online. I think it will probably work for more people. Uh, ahead of the exam. So I will announce those as well. So here is what we uh, do in the method of images. Let's say that you have a power line above the ground. Uh, you remember we solved the uh, things that I call power lines hanging in the air. But as you know, they are not really in the air. They are above the ground. Let's take one charge of this power line and put it above a ground that we approximate as a perfect, con perfect conductor. So we know the fields of the charge in free space. Radial, right? This is the first thing that we learn in this class. And we probably don't even have to learn it in this class because you have seen it before. Q by 4 pi epsilon r squared, the electric field of a point charge. But now I'm inserting a conductor, and I have no idea what is now the field. And the reason is that this charge will create now electric field lines that will have to hit the conductor at 90 degrees. And this diagram now tells me that because those field lines sink into the conductor, there is a negative charge density here. So the electric field will be a superposition of the field created by the charge and by an unknown charge density on the ground, which I have no idea what it is. So you see, this slight modification to the problem has made it practically unsolvable. But that's, what, that's something that uh, is solved with this method of images, which starts by observing that if you look at the dipole fields that we calculated, they involve a charge and its opposite. And they look like this. In fact, you can go back to your notes and see that these are the field lines. They hit this uh, mid plane at 90 degrees. at 90 degrees. So in fact, if I take an aluminum foil and I insert it here, nothing will change because the electric fields already satisfy the boundary conditions. You see, they are already hitting this mid plane at 90 degrees. So therefore, they don't need to be distorted any further. They are already in shape for this aluminum foil. And that means that these two cases are actually equivalent to each other in the upper half plane. And there is a very simple way to calculate the electric fields up here. That is, at a nearby school of a power line, or uh, whichever place that you want to calculate the field by simply introducing 
an image charge and calculating the field as a superposition of the field of the positive charge and the negative charge, which now is a simple problem to solve. And this method of images extends to general charge distributions. So for example, if you have now a power line above ground with a charge distribution rho sub L, then the fields, let's say at an observation point here where you want to uh, estimate the safety of the exposure of people nearby, can be calculated by taking the original line and an image line and finding the fields that it will produce. So for example, if you are looking at this point here, the field will be doubled because you have a field from the, po from the positive line this way and a field from a negative line this way. In fact, if you uh, go to the safety standards for electromagnetic field exposure, there is a small sentence there and says that if your system is above the ground, the exposure limit is actually becoming stricter and it's divided by a factor of two. They lower the limit of exposure. Why? Because you expect that the ground will add up uh, to your field and therefore it will raise the field by a factor of two just because there is this reinforcement of fields from the positive and, and the image charge and hence now the field doubles. So uh, generally whenever you have charge distribution above a conductor you immediately think of it as the original distribution and an image distribution. It has to be minus the original one and placed at the symmetric point with respect to the conductor. So I'll stop here. Good luck with your lab and uh, let me know if you have any uh, questions. So the next few lectures will be dedicated to examples in preparation for your midterm.